good afternoon and thank you for joining us for today's webinar on quantifying improvement project benefits. My name is Mallory and I'm going to get us started with a few logistical issues and then turn it over to our presenter, Forrest Bryce Ogle. Um, this webinar is scheduled for one hour. We may go over if we have a lot of questions, but the content will be covered within an hour. We have muted all of the phone lines so that we can get through the presentation, but please be sure to enter your questions through the text um, format in the GoToWebinar system. So please submit those throughout the webinar. If we can stop, we will definitely address those. If not, we will address them at the end. There will be a recording made of this webinar. We will provide you a link to that recording within 24 to 48 hours, so please um, be on the lookout for that. You will get an additional email with the access to the recording. As a participant in this webinar, we would like to follow up with you. If you do not want to be contacted, just let us know at the exit survey after the webinar ends. Now I will introduce our presenter, Forrest Bryce Ogle. Forrest is a professional engineer, ASQ fellow, and serves as a past advisor for the University of Texas Center for Performance Excellence. In 2004, he received a Crosby Medal for his book, Implementing Six Sigma, and was named the Quality Professional of the Year in 2011. Forrest has authored or co-authored 13 books and published over 150 technical articles in worldwide publications. He is the founder and CEO of Smarter Solutions and recently published the Integrated Enterprise Excellence book series. I will now turn it over to Forrest to get us started. Thanks again for joining. Well, it's good to be here, and I'm glad uh, we have a lot of uh, people participating in this webinar. So it's just give you an idea of where we're going with this session. We're going to be dealing with learning objectives would be great uh, predictive measurements that deal with continuous and attribute data. How can we go in and look at attribute and continuous data perhaps a little bit differently than in the past? Also, we're going to be just touching on how we can go in and quantify improvements that we've made using these particular form of scorecarding. So this would be applying to lean projects, six sigma projects, or whatever. Also, we're going to be talking about how to incorporate variability within the overall measurement system. And I think that's really important because a lot of times we have measurements that don't really include variability very well. And then we're going to talk about how can we go in and take these concepts and really link them to the overall big picture for the organization. Now, if we look at what really happens in an organization, it consists of many processes, where the output of the process is Y, and the inputs to the process are X, the process itself. So if we don't like the Y response, we need to change the X's or the process itself. If we, but often what happens within organization, we tend to manage to the Y's, where we don't really focus on that we or understand or really push for that we need to actually improve the process in order to have a long-term effect on the Y value. Now, if we start looking at issues or things that we focus on relative to process improvement, one of the very powerful techniques is lean. And so lean basically is trying to reduce seven wastes that are listed here. A lot of times we might do lean projects, but how much did we really make an improvement? Now in our survey that we sent out or asked you to fill out, we had a wide variety of responses because we're looking at uh, within this webinar, how do you quantify what you've actually done or the improvement that you made within the overall process or a relative to a process improvement project. Now, some people say it's really terrible. Well, we've got another one said it's really great. Well, hopefully, no matter where you fit within the spectrum, you're going to get some uh, good takeaways from this overall webinar because I think we're going to be presenting a little bit different than perhaps what you've seen in the past. Now the question that we really have with lean projects or other projects for that matter is did the effort actually improve the process? You know, we might feel better, it looks cleaner, but did we really improve the overall wide response of the process? 
The next question is, how much do we actually improve it? Now, if we look at the Y response, the Y response can take different formats. And that can affect upon how we actually determine how much we made to uh, difference to the process from the project that we uh, undertook. The first category is defective units. So we might look at percentage failure or nonconformance. Now this could be a transactional process. We have so many transactions that go through a system. You know, at the end of the week, we count how many transactions we had. And we look at the uh, number of nonconformance, and we can come out with a rate. Manufacturing, we might be making widgets. You know, what percentage of the widgets do we manufacture or send out uh, have problems? Another type of response would be a continuous response, where we have a specification. So for example, we might uh, look at a dimension on a part. Um, we want to see the nonconformance rate relative to achieving that dimension on a particular part. Or we might have a particular criterion for how long it takes us to ship a product, or when we actually receive a part from our suppliers. It's supposed to be within a certain window. And we like to know the percentage of time it doesn't achieve that objective. Now there's another type of metric, which is a continuous response, but we might not have a specification at all. Uh, for example, with work in process. We not, don't really have necessarily a specification, but um, we still would like to make it as low as we can, but we don't really have a specification like a mechanical part that needs to fit in an automobile. If it's too big, it's not going to fit. Too small, it's going to have too much slop in it. We just really would like to be as low as we can. So that requires a different way of looking at the data. Now in this particular webinar, I'm going to be covering the first two type responses. So let's examine the defective rate situation, number one that we had listed before. We notice now we're tracking it over time, looking at weeks. We're also looking at the number of defective units that we have. And we create 100 widgets, or we have 100 transactions for every week. We can then look at the number of defective units and divide it by the number of opportunities, and we get a defective rate. So as we scan down the page, that is move out in time, what do we notice? Well, it looks like our defective rates have been reduced. But is that true? Well, let's look at it a little over time, a little bit uh, longer. Now do we think we made a difference in uh, 10? Well, now it doesn't look like we've made as much uh, progress. It kind of went up. But do you uh, think that we maybe made an improvement for a while and it degraded? It's just very difficult to tell. So let's track this over time. Now the traditional way of actually looking at this form of metrics is using a p-chart. However, p-charts have some issues with them. And I do have a couple articles that I could be sending you, relative, one relative to the p-chart, and um, I'll give you the contact information that you can send a request to, and I can send you for more information. But for now, what I'm going to do, instead of using a p-chart because of these issues, I'm going to track it using what I call 30,000 foot level charting. And in this charting approach, I'm going to use an individual's chart. And I got a technical reason for doing this. I'm not going to get into that right now for this particular webinar. So if we track this over time, this particular defective rate, what do we notice? Well, if you're familiar with control charts, you know the two lines, the two red lines that we have there, are mathematically determined from the variability of our process. So if we got a lot of variability in our process, we're going to see the red lines be wider apart. If there's less, it's going to be narrower. Now, in the case of defective rates, it's got some other things associated with it. But 
What we noticed from this particular chart, we didn't really make any change. So the process is considered stable. We might have thought we made some improvements, but in reality, we didn't. Now, if we got up and down variability within this overall process, we can say that's the result of common cause variability. Now, if we had one that was 35% uh, defective, that would be outside the bounds. And we could say that's a special cause, and we could talk about that. But we have absolutely no right to talk about all these ups and downs as individual points. So we've got common cause variability. Now, the next question is, how are we performing? Sometimes call that process capability or process performance. But how are we really doing? Just because within these control lists doesn't mean we have a problem or not. So what I'd like to see here is a statement of how we're doing. Now, I've just recently been having some dialogue in LinkedIn. And people were saying, well, you ought to present this attribute data like we've got here in CP and CPK and process capability indices. But some suggesting that's not the right thing to do. And it can cause a lot of confusion along the way. So what I like to do is present another approach to doing it. And that's creating this 30,000 foot level chart where we want to see if the process is stable. And if it is, we can now say it's predictable. And if it's predictable, next obvious question, what did you predict? So in this case, since we have the same subgroup size, we can look at the center line and notice it's 20% nonconformance. So for this particular chart, we can say our process is predictable, and it's got a 20% nonconformance rate. Now let's consider in our organization, we undertook an improvement project to go in and try to reduce this overall defective rate. We continually tracked it over time. And now what we notice, it looks like our particular uh, defective rates start to move down. Notice the 5 there on 25. That's a control chart rule that says it looks like our processes shift. Now, if we look at it over a longer period of time, we can now notice that our process did shift. And we got a new stage. So now we can describe the process is predictable now again with an estimated capability of 22 or 12 percent nonconformance. Now this gets back to the objective for this webinar is how do we quantify it? Well, we can estimate that the difference we had from this proven project or this particular attribute defective rate was 20 percent. 12%. Now, I want to step back a little bit here and make sure that everybody understands this is not traditional control charting. This is 30,000 foot level control charts or, or metrics that we're looking at. So it's like an airplane flying high in the sky. We're not getting in all the details of the terrain below it. So if there's difference between machines, days of the week, operators, and so on, we're not really interested in quantifying the impact of that on our response. So it's the Y value of the overall response. That means the 30,000 foot level view. Now traditional control charting is more for the X values. We want to go in and take timely intervention if our process is moved to special cause condition. So for this particular form of reporting, we're looking at 30,000 foot level and now we say we did make a change, and our best estimate is it moved from about 20% to 12.2%. Now let's look at continuous response, the second type of metric that I said I would be talking about here. Now if we look in the organization, often we have red, yellow, green scorecards, or we're looking at a variable type data. So as you can see, we had a value of 8 0.83, and now it's 10.1, where criteria specification is 10. We're saying we got an out-of-spec condition. So we really need to start working on it. In this particular case, it's flatness. But it might be a delivery time. We didn't meet our criteria. 
So we need to address this issue. We got a problem. But let's track this over time. Because whenever we have a red condition, we're supposed to fix the problem. So now, in day number two, we notice it was red. Day number three, it's green. We've got a big string of green. That's great. So I guess we improved our process. Or did we? If we look over in time, we notice all of a sudden we've got some additional red signals. Well, maybe we didn't improve it. But it's hard to tell, because this is continuous response. And we're somewhat looking at its attribute. Did it meet red or green? Is there an easier way, not this, or a more effective way to actually see and examine our process? So let's look at it as a continuous response. Now I notice here, right, you may recall that 10 was our criterion, and 10 is within these control limits. But we're not looking at that relative to the control limits. That has nothing to do with it. We first want to see is our process stable. And our process is stable. So what does that mean? Well, it went from red to green, but we didn't really improve the process. It was just common cause variability. So again, if we've got common cause variability, talking about all the ups and downs is not the right thing to do. We need to go in and look at the process collectively. So let's say we start examining the process, because we wanted to make improvement to this process. We tracked it over. Well, oh, step back here a little bit. Got ahead of myself. So the next obvious question is, what do you want to do to predict it, because it's a stable process? So what we're going to do, take the data from the recent region of stability and create a histogram. Now you notice now I got the 10 value, put it out there. So the area under the curve to the right of 10 represents the percentage of time we believe we're going to be outside the specification. So it's somewhat of a two-step process here. First to see if it's stable, and then decide how well you're doing. Now if you're looking at traditional process capability statements, Someone may want to do CP and CPK or PP and PPK. Those numbers really get to be confusing. As I mentioned in LinkedIn, there was a lot of discussion, and these people were, are well-versed in process capability, much more than other people. So is there a better way of doing it? And that's what I'm going to suggest that there is. So rather than looking at the histogram or this probability density function that smooths it out on the left-hand side and try to figure out what that area is, I'm suggesting we look at it as a probability plot. Now, for those that are not familiar with probability plots, we notice on the x-axis we got the same axis, basically, as the histogram. But on the y-axis, what we have is percent less than. So if we look at the value of 10, that's where our criterion is, draw go a line up to that, we notice that we get a value of 87. So what does that mean? Well, 100 minus 87 is about 13% nonconformance. So what do we know? Well, we had the red, yellow, green scorecard. We didn't really make an improvement. And also now it looks like we got a 13% problem, and we expect it to be still about the same in the future. Now the question is, how do you present this so that uh, everybody understands in an easy to understand format? So what I'm suggesting, you put together this 30,000 foot level farmer reporting. So we're tracking over time to see if our process is stable. Again, this is a high level. You know, we're not going to be using X bar and R charts because they've got some problems. We're going to use a, an individual's chart. And we're going to have infrequent subgroup and sampling, so the variability occurs between the subgroups. So we're not trying to take timely intervention to fix problems here again. This, again, is at a high level. Difference between machines, operators, raw material lots, days of the week, and so on, time of the day, those all appear as potential sources of common cause inputs to the overall process. So in this particular case, it takes two charts. So we're looking at the stability of the process, then we're looking at the capability on the right-hand side. And then what we do with 30,000 foot level reporting, we put a statement at the bottom 
describing how our process is performing. Now again, if we don't like this particular response, we need to change the process. Because remember, y is a function of x. We need to change the x's or the process step itself. So let's get and say we did that. We started tracking over time. We notice now all of a sudden there's a looks like there's a shift in the process. If we go in and stage it and now look at the recent region of stability, take that data and put on a probability plot for our 10 value out there, our criterion, we now notice that we got a very small percentage of nonconformance, 0.013. So what's the value of the project? It changed from 12.6% to about 0.01%. So again, just to reiterate, we knew we made a change to the process, and also we could quantify the amount of difference that it made. Now we can also go in and describe the financial benefits from that. That would be a nice thing to do. But this would be looking at the metric itself that we chose to examine. Now, if we look at overall systems, how are we looking at metrics in general? Well, they're not this way. They're not using the way we're talking about. They're looking at fiscal year. They're also unrelated to improvement system. We might have people in the north wing putting together the scorecards and the people in the south wing working on process improvement, and they don't talk to each other. Also, we might be making point-to-point -point comparisons. So is that a good way of doing it? Not really, because what we really have is we need to understand that the enterprise is a system of processes. How do you pull it all together? And also we need to look at variability, incorporate that in our overall measurements. The other thing we need to be in the north wing of the building together with the south wing of the building, understanding that in order to make the metrics better, we need to do improvements. Okay, question for you here. I'd like for you to go in and select which particular type of projects that you do most often. So please uh, make your selection and we'll look at the overall response here. Okay, about half of you voted. Okay, let's give a couple more seconds here. Okay, what do we have here? Okay, looks like it's uh, lean is 18 and six sigma is 29, 27, 22. Okay, that's an interesting view. So it looks like most most people are working in some form of process improvement, and uh, but we got almost a, a very uniform distribution. Okay, great. Well, thank you for your feedback on that. Because now what we want to do is talk about how are we going to go in and determine where we want to focus our improvement efforts with the enterprise as a whole. A lot of times when we look at project selection, it often comes down from uh, uh, someone above, maybe, that, hey, this is what we ought to be working on. But are those necessarily the best project to be working on? Often they're not aligned to the scorecards that um, people are getting measured against. Projects sometimes fall off of people's plates you know, because they got other priorities. So I'm suggesting maybe we need to do something a little differently on selecting projects so that now the process owner is asking for the projects to get done. So what I've got here basically is a nine-step business system. What I'll be doing basically is walking through the thought process for this overall system and also tie the, the way we looked at metrics within this overall business system. So first step is the vision and mission and the values, who we are. What do we want to achieve and how we want to go about it doing that. That's going to pretty much uh, maintain somewhat continuity over time. If, you go, if you're in a hospital, you don't build bridges. Even if you buy another hospital, 
fundamentally going to be doing the same sort of thing there. Now let's go to step two. And I'm going to be spending more time on step two. This gets into your value chain. This looks at what you do and how do you measure what you do. And we're going to start at the top, basically. We might have something at a high level, develop product, market product, sell product, produce and deliver, invoice and collect. So those describe at a very high level what you do. Now you can also add some other steps to the front end, voice of customer and report financials. So those are the basic building blocks from what you work on. Now you've got other support activities, I'm sure IT, and labor relationship, HR, and so on. Now for each of these rectangle boxes, it actually can be drilled down to procedures. So if we like to make this as an HTML document that's readily accessible to everybody, so all they got to do is click on it and it gets down to the procedure. So if you click on those boxes, then you get to the particular procedures you have. You can tie documents and so on. So this is what the south wing of the building is working on, the process that we have, and then also we need to improve them. Now, for each of the rectangle boxes, those are the processes again, we want to look at what are good 30,000 foot level metrics relative to quality, cost, and time. So, for example, for produce and deliver products, would have lead time, defective rates, width, on time delivery, theory constraints throughput, a financial metric. So, that's how we're looking at measuring that particular box and determine how well we're doing. So this is basically a value chain. And what we'd like to have it so that you could click on it and then the oblong boxes and it gives you metrics. So we've got software that does this, and we call it EPRS, or Enterprise Performance Reporting System Software that'll do that for you. So the idea is it goes out and pulls data from your databases to pull together these metrics like we just talked about earlier. So whenever you click on the rectangle boxes, you get down to the process. In the oblong boxes, you look at the metrics or how we're measuring those particular processes. So again, the format that we're presenting it into would be like we just showed previously where we look kind of look at the process is stable. And if it is, we're going to make a prediction statement. So when you start looking at all these metrics like that, you can go in and start figuring out where I should be focusing my efforts to improve as a whole. And that's what we want to do in the next step. We want to analyze the business as a whole, looking at our value chain, the metrics that we have there, looking for constraints, ways, speed to market, and so on, trying to figure out what we should be going together, putting together data as much as we can. The next step we want to get smart at specific, measurable, actual, relevant and time-based goals that are aligned to the satellite level metrics and the 30,000 foot level metrics. Now satellite metrics are, are financial metrics like profit margins and year over year growth. But it's not tracking it just what happened last quarter, but over time. So if nothing has changed for the last three years, for profit margin, we have three years of data that we track over time, similarly to, similarly to how we track those other metrics. We also have the, so we want to establish goals for that. We want to look at over time what's the goal we've had, maybe look at our competition and so on, and create realistic goals. We look at growth, and we can also look at profit margin. Now what we want to do next is create strategies. And I want to get these strategies worded so I can get my arms around them. A lot of times we have strategies that are saying basically, I want to be the best of the best. Gilbert even uh, had a cartoon today in a uh, paper about that. You know, and so I thought that was uh, dealing with strategies. And so, and the CEO said something, I want to be nimble. That's my strategy. And Dilbert had his comment about that. And that, But that's why we often have strategies. But what I'm suggesting more 
more often than not, those are almost like vision statements, you know, mission statements, almost like step number one. I want to create strategies that more you can get your arms around. And then I want to get a high potential area that I should be focusing on. It's like a keynote with a major defense contract a while back, and the, uh, the general manager was describing how many lean projects they were doing. Well, that's great. And I toured the facility. I said, man, you're doing a great job in lean, but I noticed you've got a lot of hot equipment. What projects are you doing in sales and marketing? It's obviously your bottleneck. As in nothing. Well, we need to go in and start identifying high potential areas that's going to help the big picture. Otherwise, we can do all this great and wonderful things in silos, but it doesn't help the big picture. And then what we want to we want to do is take those steps. Like step number four is business goals. Okay, increase profit margins. Then we want to get strategies. That's step five. So that's that's the second column over. We want to high potential areas that we're going to be working on. Those particular areas of the business. And then that leads to projects that we're going to be working on. So now we can see how our projects are lining up to the enterprise as a whole. We call this an enterprise improvement plan. Now, after we've done that, we want to follow a consistent roadmap. So we're looking at uh, the de define, measure, analyze, improve, control roadmap of uh, Lean Six Sigma. But what we've done here is added some other um, caveats to it. So a lot of times people say, I want to do Lean first, then Six Sigma, or vice versa. And I suggest you ought to be using the right tool at the right time. So what I've done with this particular roadmap, uh, I've well, I developed it in 1999 when uh, uh, I, my implementing Six Sigma came out that I noticed, well, I put the, the tools in the particular phase that I thought GE did. And GE had a lot of tools in the major phase that, to me, weren't really major. So I broke it down to uh, baseline projects, measurement system analysis, and wisdom of the organization would contain flow charting, cause and effect diagram, cause and effect matrix, and FMEA. Now, in the second edition of Implementing Six Sigma, I added Lean here. And then in the Integrated Enterprise Excellence Volume 3, which came out in 2008, I've added uh, Lean and also the improved phase of this overall roadmap. So I think it's really important to look at what metric we're trying to improve and then use the right tool at the right time. And this provides a consistent roadmap to, uh, so that everybody's working in the, in the same direction for the projects. And then we want to see how well our project is doing relative to the goals that we had for it. Maintain the gain, very important part. A lot of times I have hear people talk about, well, we have, don't have a really good control system for this. It kind of after the spotlight's off of it, we lose focus. Well, what I'm suggesting here, this can be part of the value chain. So it's not going to lose this focus because you're continually looking at the data. And you're, it's readily available for anybody to look at, from the CEO up down to the line operator if they all had access, ideally. Obviously, everybody's not going to be looking at everything, but you're going to be looking at the areas. And now you have more um, chances for identifying things when they go awry. And so you have more of a control mechanism to do that. The other thing also, and I kind of uh, stepped over it, is in the value chain, whenever we establish these goals, 30,000 per level goals, that we need to prove there's going to be an owner of that. And that owner is going to be asking for that project to get done. Because what we're really trying to do is improve the metrics. You know, where most projects are not focusing so much on the metrics, they're looking at how much uh, financial savings that we might achieve from that. But a lot of times that number does not come out to be as uh, beneficial or uh, is aligned to what the real world is as we might like to think. So I'm looking at it at a high level, so now the process owner is asking for that project to get done. Now the other important point here is notice, now if the project did a really good job, then they change the value chain. That's in step number two as procedures. That changed the 30,000 foot level metric would change the satellite. And again, those are tracked using the same format that I I'll present it earlier. You might notice also that step nine loops back to step number three, not step number one. So 
We're going to continually do somewhat of a plan, do, check, as in Deming would say, for the overall business, keeping between three, step three and step nine. So just to kind of wrap it up here, what we covered, talked about creating predictive performance measure for the process for both continuous and attribute data. Talked about using this particular farmer reporting to determine if we made an improvement and then quantify how much improvement we made. We also included variability within the overall assessment, which is really consistent with what uh, Deming I thought was so important. And we also looked at creating uh, a linkage between process improvement project, the organizational strategies and goals. Okay, so uh, what, the, what kind of questions we might have had? Again, please feel free to submit your questions um, through the GoToWebinar system. Text them in, and we'll be happy to get them over to Forrest. The first question that came in, data in your continuous response example was normally distributed. What can be done with non-normal data? OK, the very good questions. A lot of times, we uh, have situations where uh, data is not normally distributed, especially in transactional processes, where, for example, we're looking at um, how long or how far away from the due date does something come in. So it can't get below, uh, very much below the due date, or you might even have a flatness of a part, can't get below zero. So whenever you have a boundary like that, then uh, you can go in and uh, do a, a transformation on the data. So instead of having the bell-shaped curve where you have the tails going to plus or minus infinity, you would have a lower bound that would be uh, somewhere around in the zero category and have a long tail to it. And then once you do that through the transformation, then uh, you can still analyze, analyze the data similar to what we had before. You would just have, a, if it were long normal, you would in the individual's plot, you would have a Fox-Cox transformation with lambda 1 and a normal probability plot. And you'd just be doing it basically the same way from there. OK, and the next question is, what is an IEE process? The IEE process, I guess there's really uh, two different ways of looking at that. One way is looking at it from the business side. The, uh, you know, right now, we have an the nine-step business system, or that can also be viewed as an enterprise to make system. So now what we're doing is, uh, from a, a high level and enterprise view, the nine-step business system is the IEE process for that. But as we also have the very detailed project execution uh, IEE system for actually uh, undertaking projects. And that's described in volume three, which is like 1,100 pages. You go very detail on that. And then we also have the Lean Six Sigma Project Execution Guide, which is somewhat of a memory jogger for uh, implementing and executing those projects. OK. And how do you deal with one-sided specification? For example, we try for 100% success rate. OK, let's see. If, if that, uh, you might text this in here, are you talking about attribute data or are you talking about continuous data? Because if you can, sometimes you'll have attribute or defective rate data and that's, it's attribute data, okay. So, so that presents a, a real problem because uh, uh, you know, right now you can't uh, go in and uh, uh, you know, it basically have any kind of failures. So, in order to achieve that, you really need to have the overall process so that it's robust and it doesn't give you any kind of problems. Because you can't measure it in, because any defect is a problem to you. So, uh, so for example, if you uh, go, you might use like design of experiment techniques to go in and see what I could do to determine and make it so that I don't have any failures. And I could maybe another thing they can do is stress things to a failure. Like a number of years ago at IBM, I did design experiments, and this was in the 80s when CDs were just coming out, where we, uh, we really didn't want to have any failures on the CD drive. So 
So I, I basically built 16 different drives and 12 different uh, types of changes that you'd incorporate, and they were mixed up in all these 16 different drives in the, uh, using the DOE matrix, and I stressed it in a salt environment to see when that failed. So I was able to use another particular response to give an indicator of, of how well it's performing. And then from this, I was able to determine what design changes could make a difference. Now, the other thing you can have here is, let's say uh, you've got a situation where uh, we got safety. We're sa obviously, safety is not something you uh, want to have any issues with. So what we could do with the 30,000 foot level view is instead of looking at just the, how many safety uh, situations do we have this month, we can look at the time between the safety events. And then we can uh, track that. So we basically changed our attribute data continuous response. So uh, I hope that helped. But whenever you've got an attribute response in a situation like that, you've got to start uh, looking at uh, doing something fundamentally different because measurements is not going to get you there. OK. And what does IEE stand for? Integrated Enterprise Excellence. Okay, and the next question is, can you provide an example of where 30,000 foot level metrics have been used to gain additional insights? Yes, we're dealing with a mining company down in uh, South America, and they, they were going in and looking at, uh, what they do is they create a particular concentrate. You know, it's fundamentally a powder, it's a metal that they put out of the ground, go through the process. But when you start looking at, uh, uh, in this case, silica is uh, a contaminant. And a lot of times we'll look at uh, how it's actually performing and uh, react to what's happening uh, at the end of the day or whenever you have meetings. You'll look at these are the kind of problems that you have. But uh, whenever I started putting the information in this particular format for their value chain, it completely changed the dynamics of the meeting. It was instead of uh, looking at the problems of the day we had, we started looking at the overall system. And, and for example, the mine, mining manager, where they pull their ore out of the ground, said, gee, I might be the bottleneck here, um, and maybe I need to start working in new and reducing the amount of downtime that I'm having or the amount of time it takes to um, go in and maintain these monster trucks that they have. And that's what you want to have the organization start looking at. And that's what our software can help you do, start looking at the overall system to figure out where you should focus your efforts instead of setting arbitrary goals or somewhat arbitrary goals throughout the organization and tracking them using red, yellow, green scorecards, which can lead to much firefighting and much frustration along the way. OK. And the next question, if you have attribute data, defective rates, Get, getting smaller would think that a zero could be within the upper and lower control limit. Obviously, a minus defective rate is not possible. What would you do to address the situation? Yes, it's another very good uh, technical question that you can be encountered. Because sometimes if you even look at the P-chart, they set as a lower limit of zero. And you could do that. But the problem is, is uh, you will not be able to really easily detect if you're effective rate actually went down. So in my mind, a better way that works most of the time, not 100%, is you, you might need to transform the actual data. Again, we're going to be using an individual's chart primarily here on this. And you might have to take like a square root transformation or a log normal transformation. And, and then, uh, then in many kind of situations, the zero is outside your limit. So now we can start seeing that you had to make a shift. Now, some people may say, well, the axes don't mean anything on the control chart because they're through a transformation. Now, I won't disagree with that. But the point is, you shouldn't look at the axes anyway on the control chart. You should look at it from the capability statement. So for the situation that we, if we were taking a log normal square root and we looked at the uh, failure rate, then for the recent region of stability, we could then look at the total number of incidences it had, and that could be from the last three weeks, three months, or three years, and look at the total number of failures and divide one by the other, and that represents our estimated overall failure rate. So again, the control chart at the 30,000 level view 
is to determine if the process is stable. We're not trying to fix anything again. And then, then the uh, uh, capability statement describes how we're actually performing. Okay, and the next question, are you in favor of continuing the use of red, yellow, green scorecards supplemented with these techniques, or do you prefer throwing out those scorecards and going 100% with the control charts and probability plots? If the latter, have you found agreement with managers to do just that? Could, what, we, what we do when we actually have this in the software, we, we do have uh, red, yellow, green, but red, yellow, green takes a different connotation. And, and red might be I'm working on a process improvement project, or yellow might be I've got a situation where something just went out of control and it needs to get evaluated, and green, everything is going okay, and as long as nothing changes. So it's changing the context of how you look at red, yellow, green. Now, red, yellow, green scorecards can be very beneficial for the X values of a process. So, for example, if you got a, a, a call in the call center, okay, so we could establish a red if the whole time gets to be beyond a certain level. So what does that mean? That's an X value. That means we need to have people, more people on the phone. Or if we got uh, on the checkout line in a grocery store, if the average number of people get to be beyond a certain level, that becomes a red signal, and now we're doing it. So the red, yellow, green scorecard can be used somewhat in a pre-control fashion to take timely intervention. Now, to deal with the, uh, his last comment he made, which is very germane, is uh, what's the embracement of management to use the red, yellow, replace the red, yellow, green scorecard with the, uh, you know, as far as the way they're currently using with the 30,000 foot level chart. And, and a lot of times, it's initially people are resistant to it because it's different. But, but once they start getting it, they really uh, get excited about it. So you know, when you're presenting it to someone else, what I suggest is you take a particular set of data and uh, that's presented as red, yellow, green, and ask your manager one-on-one. -on -one, you don't want to embarrass the or she. Is ask them, what do you think you made an improvement? You know, and then they say, well, uh, you know, yeah, I think we did. It went from red to green. And then you show the 30,000 foot level and you show, hey, no, we got this fundamentally a 10% problem. We have made an improvement in the last 10 years. You know, and so that's not necessarily going to get them very excited, but uh, that's the way it is. So now when you start presenting that way, and if that particular individual is receptive to a uh, new way of thinking things, then that can be your, your foot in the door to start making those changes. Okay, and is the software standalone, or does it have to be integrated into enterprise-type IT systems? We can do it either way. Okay, we we do have a, a, a version so that we can uh, uh, license it on an individual basis, on a corporate basis. So it it uh, it, it works with Minitab, and so you, we have it's, uh, it's it's fairly sophisticated macros that would uh, do that. And then it would create these particular charts. And, so, and this could be very beneficial for people to actually go in and implement it you know, and show the benefits of this way of reporting. Because it is different. Okay? Then what we do is have it also that you can do it uh, within the overall system. So you can uh, uh, have it so it pulls from the data and so on. So we can, we can uh, work with you on either way. So just give us a call with the phone number there. We can talk more about it. All right. Well, thank you for joining us. That's the last of the questions. If if you have any questions that didn't get addressed or want to dive deeper into these, please feel free to give Forrest a call or send him an email as well as um, interest in the article. Um, you will have his email there and we'll follow up with you in regarding to access to the recording if you would like access to that. And again, thank you for taking the time and uh, we appreciate it.